I am uh, with Professor Guido Silvestri, Professor at Emory University. Benvenuto, Guido. Grazie. Thank you. Um, you have dedicated your career to AIDS and HIV research, therapy, vaccines, and cure. Could you summarize your research for your our isn't a wide ranging audience? Yeah, I, I trained as a as a physician in um, <clears throat> back in Italy. Uh, I graduated from the University of Ancona in 1987, and with a thesis that involved, you know, the, the sort of studying the NK cells, in fact, uh, on, on uh, during HIV infection and other conditions. And uh, and then I took a liking on uh, laboratory medicine and and working in uh, in the lab. And I, um, yeah, I mean, I started doing research sort of full time in the early 90s, and then. Um, some point I decided to you know remain in the United States and uh, where I established my research lab and my family at the same time and uh, yeah here I am 30 some years later in um, <clears throat> still doing HIV AIDS research uh, the um, as you can imagine you know in the late 80s early 90s you know HIV was such a scourge you know with so many people um, dying that it was uh, uh, very interesting from from the scientific point of view to study the virus and the immune response to the virus and the immune interaction with the virus. Uh, now is um, I think we made tremendous progress, so it's a different, very different landscape. We're trying to <clears throat> eliminate the virus, you know, with with the combination of a vaccine, an effective vaccine, and a uh, an approach, you know, an intervention that would uh, eliminate the virus from the body of, of infected people. So HIV infection is no longer a, a, a death sentence, it's a, is a, a very treatable infection. We, we are in a much, much better place than we were 30 years ago when I, 30 some years ago when I started, but uh, it's, um, there's still a lot to do. What are you, are you most excited about regarding future directions uh, in your field? Well, in general, I mean, I think with the COVID pandemic, we realized that the interaction between viruses and uh, and the host immune system is is complicated. That there are a ton of viruses that they keep coming at us, but also we interact with them. So it's really the the, the concept of studying not just the virus in a vacuum or the immune system in a vacuum, but to um, to focus on the interaction. And uh, because they, it's the interaction what causes disease, you know, we are loaded with viruses you know, from our genome to our virome in many organs. Uh, but um, occasionally those viruses create problems and in understanding why that happens is, is uh, I think it's, a, it's an exciting new frontier of, uh, of science and medicine particularly because we have uh, extremely effective research tools, you know, uh, multi-omics, uh, um, uh, all sort of spatial, spatial technology, spatial mass spec, spatial transcriptomics. We have computational abilities that we could only dream of a few decades ago. Uh, we are at the, you know, beginning of the artificial intelligence era that will be definitely applied to uh, understanding a lot of the so-called interactomics between the viral and host proteins. So that there's, it's, it's an exciting time. There's, there's no question. But it's also a time of challenges because we have a lot of, you know, uh, yeah, we have a lot of challenges in science. You know, we have a, a declining trust uh, of, um, of the public sometimes. We have a complex relationship with the politics and politicians. We have a complex relationship with the for-profit. You know, I come from the academia where science is done, you know, ideally for the good of people, not to not to make money, but we intersect with the private sector, uh, the for-profit sector, and, and so and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of uh, opportunities and, and also some, some important challenges. You are also Vice President for Basic and Translational Research at Emory's Health Science Center, overseeing research funding for over $1 billion. And you co-direct the NIH-funded Arrays HIV initiatives. So I imagine that these are executive roles and quite different from doing basic research. So tell us about your work in these roles and how do you manage having all these important positions at once? 
Well, the yeah, the RAs HIV is a, is a large program project project grant, but it's still part of the you know the uh, relatively small you know operation of a research lab. The the recent uh, appointment as as vice president for basic and translational research research at the Woodruff Health Sciences Center, which is the umbrella that covers you know the vast majority of the research operations at Emory University for, like you mentioned, you know over a billion dollars in in research funding. Is a is a more strategic um, is a more strategic role that uh, I'm excited about. I'm still in the learning phase. There's uh, clearly uh, you know I'm dealing with with areas of research that are not my specialty, you know, from cancer to neurosciences, you know, genetics, uh, child health, women health, uh, cardiology, pulmonology, all sort of things. And it's very exciting. Uh, obviously, you know, to be effective, you know the as always, the secret is not trying to, to, to you know, to micromanage things, to, to know everything, but rather to surround yourself with the real experts you know, that, that and coordinate uh, the, the interaction with them so that we can together be effective and, and solve problems. You know, there's a lot of, you know, in the US slang, they would call it, you know, tackling and blocking, you know, a lot of not particularly glorious work and then once in a while you have the you know the touchdown you have the real you know scoring the real uh, win you know like recruiting a superstar scientist or opening up a new building uh, for research or you know establishing a, a partnership you know so that, that there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> yeah a lot of obscure work and then um, occasional you know spotlight moments you have uh, been quite active also as a scientific communicator, fighting fake news during the recent pandemic and writing books. I have here um, Womini on my Kindle, uh, Womini Virus, La uh, Storia delle Grandi Battaglie del Nostro Sistema Immunitario, and uh, also this one, um, Ricomi uh, Ricominciare dalla Scienza, uh, in which you discuss the role of science to, um, uh, in today's world, a book that I found very interesting, important, needed, and at a time, time very funny too, so highly recommended. Um, so in this book, you propose a few ideas for a better response during the next pandemic. A few years later, do you think lessons were learned? Are we better prepared? And I'm not talking as much about the science communities, um, but rather the political classes, the uh, media and the society at large. Yeah, no, that was a good question. Thanks. Um, thanks, Barbara. So the, in terms of my, my role as a communicator, really, I, th there was one thing that I wanted to trying to explain to the public, you know, is what viruses really are about. And, and I think that is what you see in the book, you know, Womini and Vi uh, Virus. And uh, that, that book is kind of a pre-pandemic and um, it was well received, you know, as edited by Rizzoli, uh, it's a major publisher in Italy. And I think it's an important book in the sense that it kind of explains, you know, the, the, the ubiquitary nature of, of or ubiquitous nature of, of uh, viruses and, and how the interaction between um, humans or, or for that matter, you know, any uh, complex organism and viruses goes far beyond, you know, the, the, the concept, the idea that viruses cause disease. We started studying viruses because they, some of them cause disease, but the interaction is much more complex and fortunately much more benign. The overwhelming majority of viruses are not pathogen. They don't cause any disease. And, and in fact, you know, they're Viruses everywhere, from from the water, the, the soil, the, any anywhere you can look at. There, there are literally millions of viruses. So that that was an important uh, thing, at least to me, to to try to explain to the public. And I'm glad that it was, you know, well well received. Um, then the pandemic came, and uh, I thought it was important uh, to uh, help, you know, the effort of communicating to the public, particularly in Italy, you know, what was happening. I was shocked by the uh, level of confusion in the, in the communication. Uh, there were many layers of confusion. I have to say there was the usual, you know, conspiracy theory driven, you know, non or anti-scientific movement, folks that think that vaccines are a conspiracy to, to you know, to kill people, to put, you know, microchips in people's mind, you know, all sort of weirdness. But then there was another layer of, of 
bad communication. This idea that a the only way to to fight a pandemic was to to shut down society, and and this idea that um, you know you could kind of eliminate uh, the, the the social nature of human beings, uh, and which is even of course you know conceptually is true, right? You know if you put every human being in a bubble, right, they will not transmit viruses to each other. But that's not what you know uh, life has been designed. I mean, there's a constant exchange, you know, and it's not just an exchange of feelings and emotions and communication, but it's also literally an exchange of molecule and viruses. And we are not designed to be sterile human beings. We're not designed to be, you know, perennially masked or locked into a, a uh, some kind of a bubble. We are exchanging information. We are exchanging uh, uh, viruses all the time. And uh, and I thought it was important, you know, to to reflect on that, and also to to reflect on the fact that when when you, you know, shut down society, uh, maybe for some people it's okay because they, you know, they have a good, they're rich or they don't care or they have, you know, uh, a job that pays anyway. But you know, there were millions and millions of people that suffered tremendously. You know, the moment you close down schools, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. You know, there are kids that have been you know, we have seen an explosion of, of uh, psychiatric disorders, you know, in, in kids, you know, during the, the, the pandemic, and it continues to, to, to grow. And in fact, in the countries where, you know, schools were closed for a very short period, you know, like Norway or Denmark or Sweden, you know, the <clears throat> kids seem to do much better than, than in, in places, you know, where, where we had so this, this prolonged closure. So, and then there is the third level that is sort of the most subtle in a way, Barbara, but to me the most disturbing is the is the politicians, right? The politicians that uh, kind of use uh, a, a, a disaster like was COVID-19, because COVID-19 was a disaster, there's no question, right? It was a sanitary disaster, it was a, uh, um, you know, a social disaster in many ways, and they use it sort of to, to you know, to fight each other to say, oh, you know, you're making a mistake here. I should, you know, I would have done this, you've done that. And and it's not about, you know, working together. If there is one situation, right, where I would expect the politicians to really forget about the, you know, the differences and, and, and work together, you know, to fight this, this very unique challenge, you know. And, and I was so disappointed that very, very rarely I've seen that. There was a lot of, you know, tit for tat, a lot of, uh, uh, um, you know, trying reason to to fight each other rather than to support each other, and uh, and unfortunately, I mean, yeah, the U.S. wasn't also a particularly good example of that. So, yeah, I thought there was a lot of uh, a lot of uh, <clears throat> bad information, a lot of um, <clears throat> miscommunication, and I, you know, I tried with this uh, group of colleagues in Italy to to help communicating. You know, this was really related to COVID. It wasn't like something that we, we decided when, I remember when uh, Prime Minister Mario Draghi uh, decided to close the emergency on March 31st, 2022, we closed our uh, page, you know, Facebook uh, page and, and social channels. We, I think we were uh, on the range of, you know, literally millions of, of um, you know, uh, folks connecting and watching and, uh, because it was, to me, it was something related to the pandemic, you know, and thanks to the vaccines, you know, we have to say it, you know, the pandemic was, um, you know, at the end of the day, it was science that defeated the pandemic, you know, it was, it was the, our, our vaccines and uh, the RNA vaccines in particular that um, really made, made a difference. And uh, so, so without the vaccines, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have defeated COVID, you know, just... You were recently elected to the board of ISNAF. Uh, could you share your vision for ISNAF in the future? Yeah, I mean, ISNAF is, a, is an entity that I've been following for years, you know, uh, in different capacities, uh, mostly, you know, um, uh, as a supporter, I would say, you know, was part of some committees in looking at fellowship applications and things like that. But this... Uh, was recently came up, you know, this this uh, idea of me joining the board of directors, and it's something 
you know, I'm very excited about. I, I really hope I can be useful, you know, with, with, with my experience. Uh, like anything else would be a learning experience at the beginning, but I, I'm, again, I'm very proud. You know, ISNAF is a highly, highly meritorious organization and is doing fantastic things for, for research, for, for the Italian-American community, for young scientists. Uh, all the values are in the right place, all the people, uh, the right people to push the right values. So I'm very excited to be part of this team. I'll try my best and hopefully I will be useful uh, in, in, this, in this role. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Professor Silvestri. Thank you so much.